Hello and welcome back to our series on making a basic climate Earth-like model. Today we will add in greenhouse gas forcing to this model. Uh, but This is the model that we ended with last time and we calibrated it to an average surface temperature of 15 degrees Celsius or 288.15 Kelvin. Now here's the exact same model except I unfolded the variables in to simplify the appearance. Uh, over here in the solar influx it's the inverse of the albedo pi r squared for the cross-sectional area and I'm still using the 1361 watts per square meter as my solar constant coming in. And uh, you can see that things like the IR to space used to be the surface radiation times 1 minus atmospheric absorption. Well, surface radiation was Stefan Boltzmann, temperature of the fourth times surface area. It's all been enfolded into these uh, various fluxes here. That just simplifies the appearance so I can show you how to add a greenhouse effect a lot easier. I will prove that I'm still running the same one. Remember last time that we ended with a atmospheric absorption of 0.7814 so if we go over here and run the model and uh, let it go and it should come up to an equilibrium temperature of about 288.15 Kelvin. Well there it is, 15 there we go. Same model as we had last time. Nothing has changed really. I've just unfolded the variables. But now let's add in that greenhouse effect. The uh, component that we're concerned with here is atmospheric absorption really. Um, we're going to add in empirical data about the greenhouse gas forcing through the atmospheric absorption coefficient. Uh, one of the most important feedbacks we'll also add in is the water vapor feedback. Now, recall from our last episode that the greenhouse gases in our atmosphere are directly responsible for, and along with aerosols, are the major cause of the atmosphere's absorptivity and emissivity. The, uh, and again, those things are both encompassed within the atmospheric absorption coefficient over here. Now, the variables that we add to our model today come directly from empirical real-world observations of how radiation, particularly thermal IR radiation, interacts with our atmosphere. Most of what we know comes from studies done by the military to improve the efficiency of heat-seeking missiles. You know, a basic thing that we like to say in this business is if we didn't understand how radiation interacts with the atmosphere, then our heat-seeking missiles wouldn't work. Our heat-seeking missiles work. So we feel we understand this part pretty well. So these numbers I'm giving you, there's, uh, they're not just made up. There's a lot of science behind them. So the equation of interest that we're going to use here to calculate the new atmospheric absorption when we change the greenhouse gases is that the new atmospheric absorption is equal to that original atmospheric absorption that we calculated before, the 0.7814, plus W, which is a water feedback factor, times B, which is a calibration constant, which we get by comparing our model to more sophisticated global circulation models. So uh, that takes a lot of more information in than we are ready to take in right now. That is times F minus 1, and F is the forcing agent, and that's basically our CO2 forcing, our greenhouse gas direct forcing here. So we know we're going to need, in this case, uh, a W, we're going to need a B, and we're going to need an F. All right, now the B is a constant, as we said, so that's going to be the easiest to deal with. That's 0 0.02, which again we get from uh, more sophisticated global circulation models. All of these need to go in, and all of our names should be out of the way. Uh, we still have a few things to define here. I've completely messed up my atmospheric absorption coefficient over here. It's no longer a variable parameter. It is actually derived, and the formula, as we said, is going to be the original atmospheric absorption coefficient, which we said was 0 0.7814 plus uh, W times B. So W times B times one, uh, F minus 1. All right. And we have to define these things. Now, F is our forcing, and uh, it's a variable parameter. We could have no forcing. That's possible. Zero. Uh, doubling would be 2. 
Let's go ahead and take this up to three just to, you know, give it some room to play around with. We're going to start off with no forcing. That's a, a one, a one forcing, okay? So look back at our equation and you see that when F is equal to one, then, well, it's just the original atmospheric absorption. There is no forcing. Uh, nothing happens. If you were to try to change W while F was equal to 1, nothing would happen because we've said before the ocean is tied to the water vapor in the atmosphere and would drag it up and down to its equilibrium point if you tried to change it in the atmosphere. So the W becomes a function of this forcing and again we're going to have to use some empirical data and say that basically our uh, W water vapor feedback works by, as the temperature goes up, uh, more water vapor goes in. And I could tie this directly to temperature, make this a little more sophisticated, but I'm going to use a quick, dirty shortcut here and just say, uh, we know that it's related to the amount of greenhouse gas forcing through studies in a manner such that W is equal to 1.4 times the forcing parameter. All right, and I, that's it. That is honestly all you need to do to start playing around with this in a greenhouse gas forcing model. I pull up our run dialog box, and on page two, we want to place a slide bar, which is this time not atmospheric absorption. It's that forcing agent. All right, so uh, over here, we want to have the temperature, atmospheric temperature again. And we've set it initially to an F is equal to 1, that is no forcing whatsoever. And we should be coming up to the same temperature equilibrium we did before, which was 288.15 Kelvin. So as it comes up, it starts to equilibrate, we're finding it's 287, it hasn't come up completely, 288. And finally, when it hits towards the end, 288.15. Yep. So no forcing means we're still at 15 degrees Celsius average temperature. So uh, we could do like the University of Colorado uh, greenhouse gas simulator did and have a decreased greenhouse gas effect. I could take it to half of what it was. Uh, in this case, we should see the temperature go down. Now I'm not going to erase the old one. We're going to use some comparisons. So I let this thing go run again from the very beginning, shoots up a yellow line this time, and it should come up slightly underneath the last one. And boy, is it ever so slightly underneath. <laughs> it's coming out to, uh, let's see if I can get it, 287.73, so about a half a degree Celsius uh, colder in that case. All right, well, let's play around with what happens if we go in the other direction. Um, now, we've got a situation now that we have about 400 parts per million uh, of CO2, whereas the pre-industrial is about 280. And we could do a quick little uh, calculation of what's 400 divided by 280, and it's about 1.43. That's the relative forcing of CO2 greenhouse effect that we have right now. We have not doubled the amount of CO2 in our atmosphere since pre-industrial times, but we have taken it up to 400 approximately parts per million, which is going to be an F value of 1.43. Again, I calculate that by 400 divided by 280. All right, what happens to our planet once we do that? Go back to page one, stop it and then run again, and this time we get a green line which comes up, and it should equilibrate slightly higher than either of the previous two. And as it goes up, yeah, it is slightly higher. And what I'm going to do at this point is start to let these lines just run slightly longer than we did before, so that I can start to see exactly what their value is. All right. This one has a value of 289.17 Kelvin, and that is one degree Celsius warmer than it was before. Over the period since the Industrial Revolution, we have actually seen a warming on our planet of about 0.8 degrees Celsius, not a full degree Celsius like this model shows. However, this model also shows you that 
when you suddenly change the greenhouse gas forcing, you see how it takes time for the temperature to rise up to equilibrium. It's like putting a pot of water onto a stove. It takes time for that water to get up to the temperature of equilibrium. And so, yes, we've only had 0.8 degrees Celsius, and, but if we were to cap our greenhouse gas forcing right now, we would continue to warm up to this predicted 1 degree Celsius warming that we've seen. And we actually think it's more like 1.2 with all the model forcings put in. This is a, again, first approximation model. Well, let's go back and say what happens if we do double the amount of greenhouse gas in our atmosphere. That would be a forcing factor of 2. Come back over here and stop and give it one more run. This is going to be a brown line that comes up and it will be again slightly higher than the previous two. Now um, a doubling of CO2 will lead to a certain change in temperature and that is referred to as the climate sensitivity of the planet. And what we're doing right here is exactly that kind of an experiment. If we double the amount of CO2, how much will the temperature rise from that 288.15 Kelvin it was before? And now we find that with a doubling of CO2, it comes up to 291.56, or in other words, a little over 3 degrees Celsius or 3 Kelvin. And that is actually what most consensus scientists say that is the doubling for uh, the climate sensitivity for our planet, about 3 degrees Celsius. So you made a model that has a climate sensitivity of 3 degrees Celsius, and you shouldn't be too surprised. I mean, you did use data used by other global climate circulation models to calibrate your feedbacks, and so it should come out to about the same answer that they come out to as well. But think about all the other feedbacks that are in place here. Uh, all the things that we did not incorporate in, right? Think about ice albedo feedback. That would be one. Think about um, ocean absorptivity of CO2. As oceans get warmer, they can not hold as much CO2 and belch it back in the atmosphere. And colder oceans absorb more CO2. Uh, how about the biosphere? Um, life on land and life in the oceans. How will they react to a temperature change and either add to greenhouse gases or remove them. Permafrost melting, releasing greenhouse gases. Hydrates, frozen methane hydrates melting on the ocean floors. Atmospheric lapse rate changing in the atmosphere. All these things we did not incorporate. But a true global circulation model, and especially the coupled global circulation models that take in the ocean circulation as well, they take all this into account as much as they can. Uh, and so, you know, we we know that every model is wrong, but I hope you see through this exercise that some models are useful. Obviously, you can see that the model we've built is only a rough approximation of a climate model, but at the same time, you did just compile several differential equations and integrate them. And in the end, how hard was that with the help of graphical software like this? That's some pretty heavy mathematics. So I hope you've enjoyed this introduction to box modeling. Depending on your reaction to this series, I may follow up with episodes that model other natural systems. So, please, enjoy your modeling, and of course, as always, take care.